Welcome back, everyone. I'm here again with Dr. Sean McFate. Uh, today, we have a tantalizing question. Is the tank dead? You go. You, yeah, <laughs> I'll, so, have, I'll have I'll have our I'll have our light infantry, light airborne yeah, infantry. All right, guy so just to be first. fair, Sean, we are both army vets. We met a long time ago in, in, in grad school and you were a tanker, right? Yeah. Okay. And I'm a I'm a light I'm a light airborne infantry guy. Okay. And you would call light air you you call infantry guys like me what what tread grease? Uh. Well, I, I haven't heard that one. But yeah. either crunchies, crunchies, um, yes, or or earth pigs. That one works earth, too. Yeah. Well, crunchies, the noise that you make was you know we never wanted to, to sleep near a tank because they'd back up and anyway anyway so I um. Last week on a Sunday, I started a flame war without knowing it on social media because it was the graduation of West Point. General Milley, who's the, you know, the CGSC, who's the, the highest ranking general in the U.S. Armed Forces, went up to give the, the commencement address to the cadets. And of course, he was a cadet a long time ago, like 40 years ago. Um, I, thought he, I thought he went, didn't he go to Princeton? Oh, you're right. He went to Princeton. He went to Princeton. Yeah, he was, Thank you yeah, for that. He was not. Yeah, he, he was, was not a yes, West right. Point. So um, he said something that he he did in his speech, which I read, said like he was sitting in their seats 40 years ago, but I forgot he was sitting, you know, and, you know, anyway, he was Princeton. He's a Princeton guy. It's hard to see. But, you know, he said something in the future. They're going to prepare for new threats. And he listed as one of the future things, you know, robotic tanks. And I just thought that was the silliest thing. I guffawed when I read it into my coffee. And I put out a, a message on LinkedIn and Twitter saying robotic tanks, this is this, you know, tanks are obsolete. Robotic tanks, this is absurd, you know? And oh my goodness, the, the army tank community descended on me in mass to show me how wrong I was with a lot of glee and schadenfreude, but I stood my ground and that's what we are here to discuss, how I made the case that tanks are obsolete. They haven't been in, important in an American war since you know, 1945, maybe the Korean War. Why do we still have them? It's absurd. And they haven't been important in, in any war since 1973, which is like, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. So, you know, holding on to tanks, it's like, it's like, it's like in the 1890s holding on to the horse cavalry charge from Napoleon because that was the thing when you were a young person. And so I think it's just pure sentimentalism. Meanwhile, we're spending lots of money and it's a bad way to die in a battlefield in the tank. You know, ask any Russian who are giving their tanks up now to like gorillas with javelins because they'd rather surrender their tank than be burned alive. So I think I will stand by my, I will stand firm on my parapet as a light infantry dude and say, tanks are, that's old war. New war, you know, doesn't involve tanks. Tanks are dead. Okay. So I can explain why if you want me to be less catty, but yes. Well, well, let me let me let me let me get my shots in. Yeah, yeah, get your so, saber rounds in. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, the saber rounds. So I would have to be mentally challenged to say that tanks can still be employed in exactly the same ways they could in the past. However. There are certain situations where you're not going to be able to move without tanks. So let me let me be specific about what I mean. So let, let's take kind of the 2003 experience just as a, as a starter. When you have battles like Fallujah, right? When I heard that the Marines used tanks in Fallujah, I was horrified. I would never. That's the absolute like worst possible place that you could use a tank because your range doesn't matter. Your armor will help. It'll help like infantry that's behind you not get shot, but you're just a walking tomb or you're like a, a moving right. tomb. Yeah. However, um, and, and by the way, the same is true in the north of Kiev where it's heavily wooded area, you're near the Pripet marsh, marshes, um, 
there's lots of mud. You have to stay in very canalized uh, you know, roads, ter- you know, terrain, et cetera. Again, if you're dealing with light infantry with javelins, it is, um, it's death, right? You're, you're, you're going to get annihilated. Terrible place for tanks to go. However, if you're in the Donbass and you can see 10 kilometers ahead of you, light infantry with their 500 meters of effective range ain't going to cut it. You're not going to be able to move. Even with drones in the air and, and, th- and things like that, you need tanks, you need armor to move forward on flat terrain. Same thing, same goes with the um, desert, desert storm, right? Where massive conventional battle against an entrenched Iraqi force wide in the open where range and armor matter. I think there'll always be a place for that. Now, robotic tanks, that's, um, I think that's probably an evolution that we will see. And the reason we'll see it is for the reasons that you deride the continued use of tanks is you're going to, you know, with drones and other technologies, they're going to take a lot more casualties. So why put troops in when you can just send out robotic tanks to, to at least seize the terrain so that you can get your soft assets forward um, in places that have that wide open range. So that's kind of how I see it evolving. I think the death of the tank is really just a, um, a reaction, a strong reaction to new technologies like drones and just misapplication of tanks in the current conflict, particularly so, in those let areas. Me, let me, well, I agree with that. So like, look, if tanks are valuable in modern warfare, then it makes us have robotic tanks. For the same reason it makes us have robotic, you know, UAVs and drones, you know, to, you know, we don't, you know, that makes sense. But my larger argument is that Tanks, I'm thinking like the M1 tank, big battle main tanks. I'm not talking about other types that exist. The big, the main tank, I think it's had its day. And I'll tell you why is that if tanks were so important for like desert, then why didn't we use them? Where were they in Iraq and Afghanistan for the last 20 years? We didn't, we didn't really use them because they weren't very useful, um, especially if you're fighting well, a guerrilla force. Well, okay, yeah, I would. When you're dislodging a conventional military, they're absolutely useful. Right. Um, they're, certainly, we, yeah. they're certainly less useful when you're confronting a, you know, you're fighting an insurgency or, or a counter. Or a guerrilla movement. Or, so that's my point. Right. I think warfare is, is trending towards guerrilla warfare, where like a $150,000 javelin can defeat, you know, a, a multi-million dollar tank. Mm-hmm. And I think, and the javelin's not even hugely sophisticated. We've had them for a while now. I mean, it's- unless unless you're in the Donbass, and there aren't very many places for you to hide. So, and and I and I I talk about this from experience because we yeah. fought against the 82nd Airborne mm-hmm. during the first test. I don't know if it was the first test deployment of javelins, but in October 2001, I had to fight like the Russians. Against right. the 82nd Airborne uh, and in their javelin teams, and the way that I defeated them was I just, yeah, I just got a map, looked yeah. at all the places that were not wide in the open where they could hide, and I would just draw four kilometer, right. uh, you know, diameter circles around them, and I would just avoid it. And I just, you know, we did we just encircle them and cut them off, destroy their supplies, and let them wither on the vine, and you know, the end. But that yeah, was yeah. wide open terrain. Okay. Right? So we discussed this in an earlier segment is that one of the advantages of the Donbass is that it favors Russian tactical maneuver. Um, yeah. And you're correct. So it, just to be clear, a, a tank's range far exceeds a, like a javelin's range. Is that fair to say? Yes. And so you, ha- you just, you hang back beyond the range where they can't harm you and you just nail them. But do you need a tank to do that? You know, kind of like a Toyota with a Hilux 
you know, like a Toyota Hilux with like a 20 millimeter, you know, artillery, any artillery aircraft thing on the back of it, you know, do that? Do you need to invest in very expensive tanks to do what you're talking about? So to just do like standoff range sort of things, no. Or artillery, How, yeah. Yeah. However, however, to take territory, you need armor. Otherwise, because those things will never make it because a 50 cal will take them out or, um, you know, like a Toyota, you know, whatever. Or, uh, and then they're just as vulnerable to drones and, and things like that. So there's, uh, well, I'm not saying go all in on tanks. I'm just saying that mm. there's, there's always going to be a role in certain types of conflict. So in a conventional conflict, if we were going up against the Russians and all we had were javelins, even as incompetent as they are, we wouldn't be able to take territory in the Donbass. We just wouldn't. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, yeah. To be fair, if we had air superiority. Well, leaving that, okay, let's leave right. air superiority at that because, you know, but I mean, I guess, I guess I'm asking is like, you know, tanks are very expensive to buy, train and maintain and to move between theaters, you know? Um, you know, or the last time there was an effect that where tanks decisively won a war, I would say was 1973 Israel versus the last Arab Israeli war. I wouldn't say the, the, the first Gulf War or the first stage of the. Um, the... Yeah. So let, like 2003. So let's discuss it. So this is where I got particularly flamed on my in my Twitter so people are like, well, wait a minute. What about the first Gulf War in 1990, 91? What, yeah, you know, 91. When, yeah. yeah. So when basically our tank divisions had a, like a turkey shoot with the Iraq military on us, especially on a particular road, and it's like it was carnage, right? And we declared victory, and um, and curiously, around the late 1980s and 1990, at the end of the Cold War, many people were arguing that the tanks' day had come and gone, and then this experience in the, in the Gulf War I resurrected the tanks' life, frankly, in the U.S. Army, because they were cutting programs like the Sergeant York and Air Defense Tank System, and they, you know, they were looking for things to cut and the peace dividend. So, you know, now here's, but here's my retort to that. So some of, some of your listeners may, rem, may remember Norman General Schwarzkopf and his very famous brief at the end. He was really like glib and hilarious to the media core about how easy this American victory was over the, the feared Iraq military. Because at that time, it was a very, it's a little bit like the Russians t today. Like we thought this was a 10 foot tall, 100 foot tall military, it turned out to be a bunch of midgets, right? Um, and we're pretty awesome. But here's why I don't think it was a, a, a solid win. We have been in Iraq ever since that war. The plan was never to have a tank battle. And you know the plan was to have a tank battle and leave and go home. Right. And Saddam Hussein was out of Kuwait. That was our objective. We achieved that objective, but we didn't get rid of any core problems. We remained for 13 years or so doing a no fly zone, being involved in Iraq. Saddam Hussein was constantly a thorn in our side. And then in 2003, we reinvade for some different but related reasons. And so I don't think that's, you can't say that war was a win because we never quite left it, you know, um, it never but, quite but, but is that is that a result of, or is that the fault of the tank or just the fault of the strategy? So for instance, in the first Gulf War, we could have completed <clears throat> the destruction of Saddam's military, but we chose not to because we stuck to the aims of the mission, which was just to reject the Iraqi army from Kuwait, which we achieved. And we didn't want to have this, um, what's the word for it? Uh, you, know what, you know which word I'm talking about, like drift, like strategic right. drift. Or, we don't, yeah, like mission creep or- yeah. Mission creep, that's exactly yeah. what I'm looking for. Yeah. So like, isn't that more of a function of political failure than- It is, systems it, it is a, it's a function of strategic failure, which is a, the political, the White House level. Like, they 
they set the bar too low. We're going to eject Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, which we all did, which the military did. But that doesn't solve the problem, you you know. And you know, but you you don't play. You can't blame the tank on that. But just like in two thousand three. You know, we achieved perfect battlefield victory over the Iraq military, but it was irrelevant for the war. And I think it would have been kind of the same thing for Iraq in 1991 as well. You could take out the military, but you don't, you're not taking out the, the, the existing war, you know, guerrilla, you know, the, the, the dynamics between Shia and Sunni and Iran and Iraq and and you know all those problems. I think we would just we would have had the Iraq War just 13 years sooner. Is my if if we actually had and the tanks was useless. You know tanks were useless in that war. In my opinion, they were pretty in terms of achieving a decisive win. You know were they useless 100? percent No, but I mean like they weren't. The you know the reason we went to a counterinsurgency strategy is because our conventional war strategies of which the tank is a big part of were not working. They were not achieving success. Well, wouldn't you argue though, that the conventional part of that war was merely the, the first and ne- necessary stage. And then the second stage, this counter insurgency or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. This counter insurgency. Yeah. Yeah. It's just um, a, a capability that we're just not as honed at and that we should just, you know, retain the former while developing and doubling down on the latter in order to get better at, yeah. at that. Because, because you can't, if we only had kind of a counterinsurgency assets and resources, we would have never gotten to the insurgency because we wouldn't have been able to defeat the conventional forces that, that faced us. So I it's kind of like saying, a necessary and sufficient I, yeah, sort of argument. I start saying, so like, you, you first have to get rid of the conventional fighters before you go to the unconventional fighters. Uh, and if you can't do that, you'll never get to the unconventional fight. And now, um, now yeah. if you have an, now, if you have an argument that can get rid of both without tanks. Yeah, I do. That's, that, that's the one worth here. That's the one. Okay. That's the one. So worth here. here's the argument. Um, and I talk about this in my book, the new rules of war is that there are strategies um, that allow the weak to defeat the strong. And I say weak in quotations. And um, Maoist strategy is an example, the Fabian strategy. So here's a strategy that has worked in Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places. And what it does is that it weaponizes time, right? So what you do is if you have to have a couple of prerequisites for the strategy to work. You have to have like an outside invading force come into your homeland and like take things over, right? Like an invader. And they have tanks and they have, you know, counterinsurgency. They have, they have everything. They're, they're superior to you in every way. But you can, what you can do is that you use guerrilla warfare to suck them into your interior where you bleed them dry and over enough time, like years, they will eventually leave of their own volition because it's to them, the, the, the benefits are not worth the costs of staying and maintaining an invasion forces. This is what, you know, China did in some part, you know, against the Japanese uh, before World War II. It's what the uh, the Vietnamese did to the United States. Uh, it's what the Afghans did to the Soviets. It's what happened to us in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's a saying in in Afghanistan that NATO may have all the watches, but we, the Af- you know, the, the Muj or whatever, the Taliban have all the time. And so, you know, there you make you you do what they call shaping operations in a military with strategic patience that you just whittle away the enemy and and you never present a target for the tanks to hit. And eventually it just becomes so expensive to maintain the occupation that the invading force just goes home. Now we can talk about it, it doesn't always work, but that is a strategy where it allows a group with a weak military to defeat a group with a strong military given certain preconditions. So that strategy, I mean, the U.S. has employed that strategy before it was the U.S., right? And, and yeah, the exactly. 
We did this in, in the Revolutionary War with Francis Marion and Nathaniel Green in the South. Yeah. But what about situations or conflicts that require the U.S. to be the aggressor, which is basically all of them, right? Um, what sorts of successful tactics can they use or strategies when they're, you know, when there's an active shooting war without yeah. tanks? Well, let's remember that we've had tanks since 1945, but we have not won a war since 1945. So I'm not sure what yeah, the argument... It, dep- it, it depends on how you define it, too, right? Politically, well, I mean, yes. Okay, a big war. Right. I mean, like, Korea was a stalemate. Vietnam was a loss. Iraq and Afghanistan were losses. I'm not counting small things like Grenada or Panama. Like, when a superpower invades a Caribbean island, you ex- it's like, you know, you expect... You know, there's yeah. no reason. You know, that's not really. That's well, I mean, the, the, like right. the first, the first Gulf War was a like that yeah. was black and white win, right? Exactly. But I think that I, I don't see many much. I mean, again, 1973 is the last time we saw any major war determined with by tank power versus some alternative. Now, like in 2006, Israel invaded Lebanon to go after Hezbollah. They launched a very conventional. Yeah. Tank heavy war with their Merkava tank, which is a very famous Israeli tank. They lost. They lost. And it's in, in, in here, there was no Hezbollah conventional force they had to wipe away at first. They, they just went, no, no, they, they did kill more Lebanese and Hezbollah. They, the Israelis did destroy more stuff. They, they achieved a conventional war win. They, you know, conventional war victory is. You capture more territory, you kill or capture more enemy people, soldiers, troops, and you, you break shit, you know, and you fly your flag over their capital. They, Israel achieved all that, but right. they lost. And that's because warfare has changed. And uh, there's a lot of reasons warfare has changed. And I talk about it in my book, but I think in this new, the way that warfare has changed does not advantage a tank any more than the way warfare changed in the early 20th century, the battleship became obsolete in the face of the, um, the flat top, the aircraft carrier. But traditionalists couldn't really see it until well, like the and the Coral Sea. Uh, that's, the, that's actually the next shoe to drop is the aircraft carrier obsolete. Yeah, exactly. With hypersonic weapons, right? Well, that's the uh, tanks, aircraft carriers, you know, all the, you know, I, 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 that's my, my whole, I mean, if you look at what the Marine Corps is doing right now, they're interesting. Now, they are taking a lot of heat, just like my little flame war uh, recently. And in my book, The New Rules of War, is taking a lot of heat. You know, it's, it, a lot of people love it, a lot of people hate it. So the Marine Corps, the new commandant, General Berger, um, he has this new vision for the Marine Corps, and it's called like Force 2030. Mm-hmm. And this vision, he took all the tanks out of the Marine Corps. Yeah, not he took, smart. <laughs> he took <laughs> all smart. the attack helicopters out of the Marine Corps. He did? Yes. And he's reorganized the Marine Corps into small, like almost guerrilla fighting units rather than these large conventional, you know, online units. Meaning when I say online, I mean like, you know, battle formation units, conventional war. He's it's it's almost like he's turning the Marine Corps into like a more of a guerrilla war capability fighting force. I'm not good. I mean, I don't go too far with that analogy, but now, as you can imagine, a lot of retired force from Marines are going ballistic. Yeah. But there's a lot of people in the Marine Corps, in DC, in Congress, who think that General Berger is smart, that this is the, this is, he's adapting the Marine Corps to modern warfare. So, you know, it's happening as we speak. It's, you know, it's not just my book, The New Rules of War, it talks about this, but it's very controversial to your point. Yeah, I mean, my, my re- reaction is you can't possibly be portraying this guy's views in a fair manner <laughs> because they sound so dumb. Like, like oh, when, I, when, I heard, when I heard attack helicopters gone, like... What's he gonna What's he gonna replace that capability with? Because even and even in the and, in, yeah, miss. All well, right. First sorry. of all, like also, I think his attack helicopters are in warehouses, but I don't think they're they're planning to fight. Uh, I could be wrong about this. Okay. But I know okay. the tanks are gone, so I, I don't. I'm gonna tread lightly here, but yeah. um, he's taking a lot of the conventional bite 
out of the, with tanks, for example, out of the Marine Corps to make the Marine Corps fight more like a guerrilla force, not a, not like they're turning into guerrillas. I'm not, I don't want to go too far with that analogy, but they're they're changing the way they organize, train, and equip for war, relying on missiles like short of sh ship missiles like Neptunes, Javelin, you know, anti-tank missiles, you know, you know, mm -hmm. anti-aircraft missiles. I mean, using that type of technology along with other types of technology to fight a different type of warfare than sort of like the tanks, you know, battle formation, et cetera. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to see it because tanks is risky, but one could argue that the types of missions that the Marine Corps engages in, which is supposed to be beach landings, even though the Army's done the largest beach landing in history. I think that's um, the beach landing is I think a bit of a canard, but yeah, you're correct. They're I think, yeah, they um, yeah, they're they're I, like mo yeah. mobile naval infantry, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like unloading a tank on a shore is not not great right <laughs> like there's a there's a there's a strong debate on like that's crazy why would you do that um right. but to get rid of attack helicopters I, i'll give you an example in the most recent conflict when i saw the russians the convoy right the 40 kilometer con or 40 mile yeah, long yeah, convoy yeah, yeah, yeah. um the one thing that I, you also didn't see is when the when the u.s military moves like that you would have uh like a, a, a cavalry regiment of, you know, screening with attack helicopters to get those javelin teams and to get, you know, things that partisans that are creeping up to unilaterally get rid of something like that is, is like stabbing your eyes in terms of, in, you know, in my opinion, that's why the Russians got crushed. Well, I, I think that the plan is to replace them with, um, you know, UAVs. So it's not like you know okay. any. So like again, um, just for listeners out there, I um, I don't want to misspeak. You can check it out; it's online. It's like Marine Force 2030. 2030 mm -hmm. is in the title. Uh, if you go to the Marine Corps homepage, and you could read their unclassified PDF about the general what they they hope to do. It's extremely controversial, but with huge advocates on both sides of this of this idea. Um, and, um, and I'm talking to members of Congress who are very for it because I'm kind of in that camp as well. Um, but it gets back to this idea that, you know, have tanks, are their best days behind them? Uh, again, I think Arab's era, era, early war of 73 is the last time we saw, anybody saw tanks play a decisive role in winning a war. Um, Wars since then, it's not been tanks. Maybe some of them were involved, but they certainly didn't win it. Um, yeah, I, again, I would strongly disagree with you on the okay. at least the, the Persian Gulf War, but that's you know, yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand your argument and you understand yeah. mine. We won the battle, but we didn't lose, we didn't win the war, is my argument with the first Gulf. Yeah, yeah, you're like we both agree that from an operational standpoint, tanks were decisive, they were, I think, yeah, yeah exactly, um, they were from, from a strategic undeniable. It, in my view, from a strategic um, standpoint, and I don't know if you would, you probably would disagree with this point, which I think is fair. I think every war that we've not been as successful in has almost 100% because of political factors, because of politicians. Um, like Afghanistan is a perfect, perfect example. So on the battlefield, um, we were extremely effective. But the the constraints that politicians put on that, you know, rump force that was there, they came up with like asinine things. Like you could only have 1500 troops. So then, you know, you forced military planners into an asinine box, which is like, well, we can't use um, Bagram. We have to use Kabul, which is, you know, when I saw that was our last airfield, yeah. I'm like, what the, like, who, what happened here? Right. Um, the general, I think he was in charge resigned before the debacle because he could see it coming. So I think our issue is fundamentally less to do with equipment. Um, I think, uh, uh, but I think you're thinking if you, at, like if you abstract it and, and take equipment out of the equation, I think is the right place 
to go. And I think where people are are fighting and engaging is on, you know, you know, which which piece of equipment should we get rid of or not. Now there are extreme examples, right? Where we have the hangar queen, the F-35, whatever, which I think are right down the middle of what you're talking about. But there are other things that like even Delta, right? In the in um 2003 or 2004, they used tanks, like tanks, <laughs> like as strategic deception, right? Where they they brought them in and there was like a tank platoon. I forget how they got them in, but they were deep, like just right outside of uh, what was Saddam's hometown, Tikrit. Like literally right outside Tikrit before forces had, you know, like in the very beginning of the invasion, they had a tank platoon, and um, they wanted to show the the Iraqis that you know we can hit you anywhere, and we might have like a tank division here. And it wasn't, and you know they had to back off because the the Tikritis, uh fought back. But it's just another tool in your toolkit. Now, should we have massive tank armadas? Absolutely not, for the reasons that you argue. But should we eliminate the tank altogether, like the Marine Corps? I think I think lots of Marines are going to die in the future, particularly if we ever get into the war with China, and the, uh, China and the U.S. So there are aspects of that strategy that I'm not aware of, or that strategy, but. Um, the doctrine that I have, I haven't read, obviously I haven't been aware of that sound like they make sense, like more reliance on missiles, more reliance on UAVs and things like that. But I would be very careful about taking something that has had a lot of utility and just discarding it. So let me ask you a question. I mean, how do we know when a, a type of weapon has seen its day? Uh, you have you have like a, you generally don't find out until it becomes a disaster, right? Well, can, like you, can, like, you, can, you, can you figure out before it becomes a disaster and replace it with something different? Is that not an option? Uh, yeah, which, which is why I think this robotic, you know, these robotic tanks are um, some, and again, think, think of it, don't just think of like one massive M1 tank and they just put AI in it and then suddenly they just roll it back out. Sure. Think of something, think of a think of a world where you have something that's the size of, I'm just trying to um you know, something that's the size of a suitcase, right? That's 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 armored, you have 10 times as many of these things, and you just flood a battlefield with them. Well, that's fine, but that's territory. not what he's talking about. He's talking about like a big tank that's auto, you know. I mean, I think. Tank- oh, you, uh, oh, Millie was talking about like a giant tank that was I, I, automated. I think so. I think he's talking yeah, about that's like automated. Yeah, yeah, that's um, dumb. I mean, I, I think I think robotic, battle hardened vehicles. That's that's fine, but I'm talking about like a sixty ton main battle tank. So I think my question is like, how do we know when? Like, how do you the battleship? You know, there were people in the early 1920s who said the day of the battleship is done, it will, the, the aircraft carrier is going to replace it. But people, mm-hmm. but other people said, no, it's it, it's the battleship. It's been around for 500 years, the king of the sea. And it wasn't until Coral Sea at Midway that they saw that you know, it was done. And the question is, how about those people in 1922 who saw it? I mean, what, you know, all the opportunity costs of, you know, building battleships could have been spent elsewhere. And I think that's kind of like what I'm searching for now. You know, it, how do we know when a when a type of system, a big type of system, has had its day? You know, the horse cavalry. Um, you know, t- in 1912, all the European great powers were doing Napoleonic horse drones every summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. In 1914, that was all relevant. Um, so that, those are the types of things I, I sometimes lie awake thinking about. Yeah. So the question is, is so like I said, I don't. I think there are specific applications where the tank is essential, and that is force on force, conventional big power. So if we got into a war with Russia or China and we didn't have tanks, we would get slaughtered. Do you think that Russia and China could win and avoid a major comp, like a major battle? We won the Cold War, but we didn't have a big battle. Um, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's 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 of course possible, but it, it requires a specific type 
of win, right? So as an, I'll give you an example, let's say that the Chinese subvert Taiwanese democracy sure. and they just vote to become a part of Taiwan. There's exactly. nothing we can there's nothing we can do about that. Or they try to and, subvert our democracy the same way. Using disinformation or I mean Well, I think I, I think I think we're pretty good at yeah, yeah, okay. subverting our own but, democracy. But well, that, that's the point. But like, <laughs> like, there are many ways to win. Is the point? I think you're. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, you know, yeah. they could use China could use economic power to subvert right. Taiwan. You know, so this idea of conventional force. I mean, and for, armed force was conventional, and there's other types of armed force too. I mean, Russia tried the conventional win; it failed. I, I, Ukraine is using an unconventional way to fight back. So, yeah, so uh, the way I look at this is it's it's an it's it's not an like in my view, it's not like a one or a zero. it's uh-huh. it's a spectrum, right? Okay. Do I think the u s should go all in on tanks and like build a next tank fleet in exactly the same way it did in the past? Absolutely. do I uh, sorry. Absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> it's probably surprised listeners there. Like he went the other way. Um, do I think that we still need to retain some <clears throat> se- sub sub segment of that capacity? Absolutely. I think I think we are playing with lives if we eliminate it entirely. Like I think if the marine, like the marines, you're right. Like they eliminated it completely. I think that's absolutely reckless. Um, do I think we need to have or to develop the muscle memory to broaden the spectrum of things that we can do? Absolutely. And I think that's the, the direction we should be going. So I think you and I um, are, are closer in uh, yeah, you know, I, I, philosophy than, the, than it looks may look like to the audience. Right? I, that's, true. that's true. That's true. We're sparring over, we're sparring over a specific weapon system. Yeah. 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 But I, I and the other thing too is I think, I think the other big issue that we have that we didn't really, t- I, I've kind of, I kind of alluded to it, but every war that we don't do well in is not like from a military perspective. It's because we have politicians that are just, in my opinion, incompetent. Yeah, like they so don't know how to apply. Yeah. They don't know how to apply this military power, and it's almost like. Um, part of this program is having some sort of um, seminar for, I know they have at the Kennedy school, they have seminars for new Congress people. I think the Pentagon needs to do something like that. Um, You know, and and where they have to go every, you know, every cycle and the entire Congress goes in and gets a, 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 another, um, what's the word for it? Reminder or re like reschooling or whatever you want to call it of what our capabilities are. What's a misapplication of military force? What's a good application of military force? Um, you need to be clear on what your goals are because we'll we'll do whatever you you know the military will do whatever you tell it to and they'll do it really well. But uh, I know a common complaint about Afghanistan is we fought the same the same two-year yeah. war 10 times or whatever. All right, can I give you a background? So that was, um, McMaster said that on his exit interview, but he stole that line from Colonel Paul Van Camp, um, who talked about Vietnam. We, saw, we fought the same one-year war nine times in a row. So again, it shows you like, all the best lines are usually cribbed from elsewhere. But yes, yeah. it certainly felt like we were, it, it was um, deja vu every every year, all over again, right? Yeah. Deja vu all over yeah. again. Go for what's that? Uh, what's that Bill Murray movie? Go uh, the, not the go the the go for day, whatever it's called, but uh, Groundhog Day. Yeah, Groundhog, Groundhog Day. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, so, I would I would say this. I mean, first of all, Congress and the Department of Defense usually don't see eye to eye. Just just be clear, you know, that's the reality of it. Um, but for your listeners, look, there, and I think this is. Sean, you were saying earlier that we 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 agree on more than we don't, which is absolutely true. Um, now, I te- I'm a professor. I teach at the National Defense University, which is the premier war college in Washington D.C. War. There are three levels in war. There is the tactical level, 
that is like the perspective of the soldier on the ground. That's like the infantry guy, the tank commander. That's like the, you know, the, the frigate driver. I mean, that's the, you know, F-18 pilot. That's what, that's also what Hollywood focuses on is the tactical mm-hmm. level of war. Then there's the operational level of war. That's like the military campaign. What are all these tactical units doing in concert to achieve a military objective in a war? Like you know? seizing the beach at Normandy, operation or seizing Overlord. the beach at Normandy or right. for Russia seizing Kiev, which failed, an operational objective that failed. Um, now at the strategic level, that's the highest level of war. And what you're doing in the strategic level, you're using all instruments of national power, not just the military one. So you're using economic power like sanctions or blockades or, you know, uh, all those things. You're using coercive diplomacy. Coercive diplomacy is, the, you know, threats, building alliances and stripping your enemy of their allies. That's all coercive diplomacy um, and, and issuing threats. And then you're doing like information and intelligence as well. And there's other things you can do as well. And it's all these things with the military that you need to do to win. It's not just the military. And America, you know, if we're candid, you know, hasn't really won a big war since 1945. We've won all the battles, but lost the wars. What that translates into is that we win on the military sliver of war. The military Mm -hmm. does its job. It wins the tactical and operational engagements. It's asked to win. But the the strategic level, which is not just the military, it's the military, it's it's, economics, diplomacy, intelligence, all the information, all those other things failed. And the military could have failed, too, at the strategic level. And that's the job of the White House, the cabinet, the national security advisor. So, you know, that's what it takes to win. We we tend, you know, the reasons we haven't been, we've been winning war, we've been winning battles, but have been losing wars is a, another s- segment, another show we could do historically. And uh, but I will say this is that um, I, t- I tend I tend to be nonpartisan, um, you know, Republican, Democrat. I, I like and dislike both for in, in equal mm-hmm. measure. I'm more of a national security guy, but I tend to think outside the national security paradigm. Is that like? This administration, I would expect to see more resignations in the foreign policy team, especially in Afghanistan. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they have not done. They got some things they got right. But um, I, I, I think like um, some of them, some of the members, some of their members of their team in the Pentagon and in the White House uh, are... Um, lacking so uh, of the strategic thought and this well, this this is something this we should is, probably talk about on our show is like what is strategic thinking how do you find it you know where are our where are the eyes and hours of today where are the george marshalls of today um you know or some would say the kissingers who's a very uh, debated character that's how I, you do a better I, job i think you and i have talked a little bit about this in the past uh, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna make, I'm about to make a hugely arrogant statement. So um, for me in particular, but you certainly are more qualified to be in one of those positions than many of the people in the current administration and in the last administration as well. Um, I feel like I'm more qualified, and I'm not even I've been I've been away from national security for twenty some years. But it's frustrating to watch some of this stuff as it goes on. Um, one one comment also that I wanted to build off of you with your, your discussion of the tactical, operational, and strategic. I feel like, and this is like a framework one could look, look at, but if you look at where the Russian and Chinese have competence, right? If I were to you know start with a um, kind of a, a funnel, right? The tip, the bottom of a funnel is the tactical. And when you're looking at those two adversaries, it widens in competence as you get to the top. So the sure. Russians are absolutely terrible at tactics. They're slightly better at operations because all their officers are kind of at that level. Um, but they're they're very good strategically. The, the U.S. 
The Russians are. Same with yeah. the Chinese. The U.S. is the exact opposite. Sure. Our widest area of competency is tactical. Operations, we're, we're, we're still really good, pretty good. Yeah. And we're better than both the Russians and the Chinese. Yeah. But at the strategic level, there's something about the um, – temporariness or the the um, i don't have the right the transitory nature yeah of the way that our leaders are chosen right that makes it very hard for the strategic to shine now don't get me wrong there is the permanent you know what what some people call the deep state Mm -hmm. which you know i have mixed feelings about but there's a you know there's a good reason we have that because it enables us to um not get jarred off track by if you've ever read the foundation series by Isaac Asimov, have you ever read that? Yes, of course. If you're the familiar mule. with the mule, right? The mule. Well, yeah. well, Donald Trump was the mule. Okay. For better or for worse, he was the mule. And when you have somebody like that, who jars that kind of national security state, you can get, you can get lodged out of, um, you know, st- strategic drift that is, or not drift, but uh, like a strategic line of sight that you've you've spent fifty years setting up, and you have somebody like the mule comes in, and they can knock right. you off course, yeah. and to a point where it's you can't recover. Right. So, you know, that's part of the problem. The other the other problem too is this kind of iron law of bureaucracy. The purpose of the bureaucracy no longer becomes its original purpose, but to preserve the bureaucracy. Um, we have a bit of that going on too so that's the the detraction of the of the weakness of the deep state so between those two factors it's hard to get strategic yeah. coherence right? we can um maybe for a future segment we can have a discussion about um because you're right we're we're exceptional we're unbeatable at the tactical and operational but the strategic level we get lapped and you know some of it has to do with regime type and some other things. So we can we can talk about in my book, the New Rules of War talks about this autocracies versus democracies in modern warfare at the strategic level. And you know, how can democracies actually win strategically? And I have some ideas about that that are very controversial. We can also discuss deep states. What are they? Do they exist? Is it paranoia or not? And again, my book actually goes into this. And deep states do exist, but they're not the same thing as a conspiracy theory. I can right. explain some of the nuance. Of right. That. that would be clear. When I say deep state, I mean permanent bureaucracy, right? Yeah, but this is not the, the uh, I mean, I don't want to talk about Steve Bannon and his administrative state, which, you know, has some ideas. But the actual deep state is, is a coin that was termed in the 1990s in Turkey um, to describe mm-hmm. Turkish uh, they were looking at political Auto, looking Auto, at, Auto Turkism. Auto Turkism. Yeah, we, which, we can talk which more is about now, that. Now dead. Yeah. It's now dead because yeah. of uh, well, you got Erdogan. Yeah, Erdogan. Erdogan. Erdogan kind of destroyed um, it. Right. Yeah, but um, that would be a good question. And also, how do we find strategic thinkers in a democracy? I mean, another, and we've talked about this. Ender's Game is one of my favorite books. You know, um, by Orson Scott Card. They made a not a good movie out of it. Um, but, you know, they, you know, this idea is like, how do we find strategic thinkers? Because I believe strongly and I train strategic thinking for the Department of Defense, but it's we can talk about that, too. That's, hard. you know, we get people well, yeah. too late. But um, I know I know. keep I keep dragging this out. I know we yeah. need to end soon. But the next, another question that's closely associated with that is how do you find them? How do you that's select them? How do you cultivate? Right? How do you find? How do you how do you protect them? You know, and. And this idea, I believe, solidly, is that it's like that, um, again, another movie reference here is Ratatouille. You know, Ratatouille, the, he's like that, he's a, he's a Disney movie, he's a rat who's, in a, you know, in a, who's also a gourmet chef. Um, there's a line in there that a great chef, not everybody can be a great chef, but a great chef can come from anywhere. And I believe it's mm-hmm. true for a good strategist, is that not everybody can be a great strategist, but they can come from anywhere. It's not just... 30 years in the military ranks and boom, you're a great strategist. I think quite opposite. It could be a 25 year old who's, you know, mountain biking through California for a living. I mean, who knows? Um, you know, what kind in of, in fact, I think that's one of the weaknesses. I think that's one of the weaknesses of our current system because the, 
institu- the, the institutionalization of what is a strategist. Well, the other thing too is it's 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 the selection. It's their well, selection bias too, because the people who become generals, well, they're politicians. They're and also um, the political appointees, which as we've discussed before, which we can discuss next time about our deep state stuff. It was like, and you were talking about that the political appointees are just they get C minuses. And what do you do about that problem? Because you you become like what what happens is like you know this to your audience as a, as a, like just a, a teaser, you know you're like a, a 33 year old who's driving vans in the Ohio you know get out the vote on election night, and next thing you know you're the assistant secretary for special operations forces or something like that, and you have no clue, but it's a you're it's a reward for your political sweat and tears to get so and so elected president, and all parties do it. It's not a Democrat. A Republican thing, and 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 that's where the rot also really is for bad strategic thinking is this political appointees, which you know we'll talk about that. And why doesn't the UK, for example, have that and stuff like that? All right, my friend, I'd, I'd keep you forever, but because uh, you, it feels like we 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 just uncovered yet another tantalizing yeah. topic. But I, uh, yeah, we got to cut it off. That's it, yeah. All right, thank you again. I really appreciate your time, and uh, I will definitely, we will definitely have something in the future to talk about that. All right, Sean. Thanks, Great. everyone. As always, thank you very much. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Oh, <laughs>